Hello, everybody. Welcome to Parsha class. Um, we're going to be talking about Justice Day, and there aren't too many songs about justice. You would think there would be more songs, but I always come back to Peter Tosh. Um, okay, let me just let me just situate us in 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 our journey through through the Torah. Um, I'm hearing some background sounds. Who is that? If check your muting, if you're unmuted. Um, okay, so. Um, Is everybody seeing the captioning on the bottom of the screen? Is that something everybody's seeing? No. Okay, I guess I see it. All right, subtle subtitle, I think. Do you see it still, Mom? You see it? It's fine? Okay. Um, just make sure it works. Okay, um, let me just situate us uh, in the uh, journey that we're taking through the Torah and through the book of Exodus. And, um, because we've arrived now at a at a real sharp turning point because we we exodus we left egypt that's the that's the big story that's the first story that's that that's the story the book is known for and then something kind of unexpected and wonderful happens which is that the the book actually becomes about revelation as much as liberation we leave egypt cross the Red Sea, and then suddenly, we talked about this last week, suddenly there's a, a revelation at, at Mount Sinai. A and that's an incredible uh, thing. We witness God, we come into contact with God. Now significantly, I'll just start to ease us into our topic here, significantly and strangely, our primary encounter with God, you know, of all time, was, um, was a, a a moment of 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 law of receiving law you know like what a strange thing we 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 come we come close to the eternal to god and what we get is a is rules laws but they don't really feel like rules they feel like great noble edicts the 10 commandments it just feels these these are that's is like the 10 highest principles, highest laws, and they do take the form of thou shalt not, but, you know, thou shalt not kill is some grand statement on, on, on violence and what kind of society we want. And some of those 10 commandments are even grander. I am the Lord your God, right? Just, there is a God. So yes, we began to receive um, laws, commandments, we call them commandments, but it felt like a great religious moment. And maybe it was consecrated in principles, but still felt like, you know, tada, a constitutional convention, maybe, but not, not a legal code. But this week we arrive at a legal code. The first great legal code in the Torah, though there are several, this one is the first recognizable chunk of laws, law, law after law after law, there are 53 altogether in this next Parsha, just after the revelation, which is called Mishpatim. We are in Parshat Mishpatim. And what we're gonna be doing today mostly is trying to figure out what that word means, Mishpat. mishpat. The mishpatim is the plural. Um, so because, because one of the questions that, just as a reader, um, you, I, I, one has inevitably is why? Why so many laws? Uh, why do I suddenly need to stop all the action and just the, this book is changing and suddenly becomes a, it becomes a kind of a legal code. Um, when I've been swept up in the majesty of revelation and the, and the, and the glory of liberation, all of a sudden, I'm getting very, very specific, very, very technical. And why, why, why suddenly does this become a, a, a legal book? Uh, and, and, and why are we heading into the beginning of, of, of the legal uh, culture that our people will be obsessed with for its history? L law and, um, and, and, and the legal regime is a huge part of the, of our, of the Jewish tradition, religion, 
And, um, and that's not true in every religion. So that's worth thinking about. But the way we're going to think about it today is to think uh, not just about the why, but also about the what. That is, what are these things? What are mishpatim? Because it becomes a very important word for us, mishpat. It recurs throughout the Torah and throughout all of Jewish literature. Um, but, and, and we often translate it as justice. Justice, mishpat justice. Oh, well then that, that isn't that an easy answer. This is one of the great hallmark values of our tradition, justice. But the truth is we've got other words for justice and and this Parsha, which is named for Mishpatim, doesn't seem to be about justice per se. And that isn't even the way you, we would usually translate Mishpatim in context here. Okay, so that's, that's what we're going to try and investigate um, today. Uh, I'm, I, somehow I feel like halting and distracted. So let's just like, I need to center myself. So let's all center ourselves um, with a blessing. And just bring some holiness into our Torah study today. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kidshanu b'mitzvotah v'tzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. Okay, all right, so here we go. Um, mishpatim, that's the name of the parsha. That's the, that's the word, that's the word of the day. Um, and we're going to see if we can figure out what it means. So let's take a look at how the parsha opens. And it has um, this famous opening. Famous because this is where we take the name. The name of a parsha is usually taken from the most important word in the first sentence. And the first sentence in this parsha, and remember, again, we're just on the heels of Revelation. Right? Moses went up on top of the mountain, and then all of a sudden, we get this list. Ve'elaha mishpatim. These are the mishpatim that you shall set before them. Okay, now how would we usually translate that? Usually we would translate that as laws or rules maybe, that you shall set before them. And indeed, we're going to get all kinds of laws, 53 of them. Now, they include some, like, some classics like what to do if your ox gores another ox and um, what to do if you, if you fall into a pit that someone dug into, into the public sphere. In other words, uh, what we're starting to look at, if, if we wanted to categorize, is, is civil law, the laws that 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 negotiate the 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 public the public square. There's so many; it's impossible to 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 review them all, and they don't all fit into that category. I mean, there are laws against idolatry and laws about keeping kosher. There's a whole catalog of laws. It isn't just about what we would think of today as 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 civil law. Let me just give you, and then we'll start to open this up for for interpretation. Let me just give you an example. Like we have this word here uh, and we can't read the whole Parsha, but I wanna give you at least one example of the kinds of laws that we find in this Parsha because it's a whole new kind of law. And the, 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 um, the intricacy, the kind of in the weeds detail, uh, detail oriented nature of these laws is new and and somewhat startling. So here's an example. This is one of the laws that really caught my eye as I was reading through the Parsha this year. Okay, so when a man steals an ox or a sheep. Now we know from the Ten Commandments that you're not supposed to steal. Okay, so this principle is out there, but now we're elaborating it, and we're elaborating it, elaborating it in a particular form. This, this when it happens, then do this. This is a certain kind of law, case law or casuistic law. When this, then do this. In other words, this doesn't have to happen, but if this circumstance arises, then you should do the following. Okay, so a particular form, and let's take a look at the law itself. When a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, he shall pay five oxen for the ox and four sheep for the sheep. Okay, so there's a penalty. If you steal someone's ox, you owe them the, the value of five oxen. If you steal someone's sheep, you owe them the value of four sheep. I don't know why it's different. That's that we could that we could that we could uh, head into the Talmud and figure out. Okay, if the thief, and this is quite a talk about um, if this happens, this is quite a striking image. 
If the thief is seized while tunneling, if the thief is somehow digging a tunnel underneath your house or, or through a wall or something like that, and he is beaten to death, you find someone in the tunnel digging under your, digging under your house and you get startled and you just kill him, then there's no blood guilt in that case. In other words, you are not responsible for that death. You do not have to serve any kind of penalty because this person was digging a hole into your house. However, if the sun has risen on him, there is blood guilt in that case. In other words, if he does it out in the, in, in the open, in the daylight, if he comes into your house and says, hey, stick him up, give me all your jewelry, you're not allowed to just kill him, okay? And if you did, you would have murdered someone. Okay, so the, the, the Torah is working out different, different, different cases of theft and what is, what is allowed and what is penalized in those different versions. Okay, you can't kill someone who comes into your house um, in broad daylight, but that person does have to pay for what they've taken. It's not, it's, you can't kill them, but it's still theft. And if he lacks the means, he shall be sold for his theft. So if he doesn't have the money to pay, he has to go into servitude, slavery or indentured servitude that we've covered earlier in the Parsha. And um, there's a maximum of six years significantly, but you can be kind of sold into a, a limited term slavery for not having the money to pay back the debt that you've incurred on a crime. Now, of course, slavery is a very charged topic in, um, in, in the world and certainly in our story. So we could like, we could spend a lot of time and we, we often do thinking about what is the Torah even allowing slavery for? My God, doesn't, haven't we learned our lessons? But we're not gonna talk about that in depth today. The point is, if you stole something and you don't have the money to pay it back, you can, uh, you can pay it back through service, through six years maximum of service. But if what he stole, whether ox or ass or sheep, um, is found alive in his possession, he shall pay double. Okay, so just yet another detail, which is that if the, uh, the, if the thing you stole has been consumed, you pay four or five times the amount. But if it's still around and you can return it, great, return it. But you still have to pay a fee, and the fee is double the amount of what you stole. Okay. Here, so here we are. I, that's it. I hope you have a feeling. This is Parshat Mishpatim. If this, then this, and you can do this, but you can't do this, and he has to pay this, and it's four for this, and it's five for this, and it's double for this, and make sure you don't kill him unless you are in the middle of the night, and then you have a right. All these, all these if-then case laws. Okay. So this gives us a feel, I think, for what we're heading into, what kind of law will become really one of, uh, 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 one of the great uh, uh, obsessions of Jewish tradition. You know, from the whole Talmud is, is busy working out all of these laws, all these details, all these cases. Okay, so that should give us a feel for it. Now, what I want to begin to ask then is, you know, what is, what is this? You know, what, what are we doing here? Are, is, is this justice? Because we sometimes translate mishpatim um, or mishpat as justice. So these are the laws, but is this is the justice? Is this what we think of as justice? What, what is the Torah up to here? Okay, um, I think I had a clarifying question from my mother. Yeah. The Torah says, if... And so is it really true that he becomes a slave? Right, and and that's so that's the way it was in the in the ancient system. Nowadays, would that be like something like he would go to jail? Right, I think yeah, there's some parallel there. But in the ancient system, the idea was not only that he was punished, but that he became a slave in order to pay back what he stole. So it would it's not just a penalty like imprisonment, but a kind of uh, penalty. That would have him working off his debt. You understand? Okay. Um, no apology. Yeah, this one's always an interesting portion. Right after the Ten Commandments, done with, and 
the next one done, we got this whole law code. I, I just find it easily tied into a portion in Devarim, mixing up the letters to get to Shof team. So there, I think we're trying to establish our society to make it inherently different from the other ancient societies and also taking in some stuff from Hammurabi's code. But why is it so focused on laws here? Is it just so that there's more explanation in how we should act, behave, and be a just society? Or is it so that we can build a society based on religious, spiritual values, and then differentiate ourselves thereby from the rest of the, that ancient world? Okay, great. So Noah says, what we can see here is that the Torah, we, not, we, we know the Torah is interested in liberation. And we also know that the Torah is interested in ethics, morals, principles, maybe what we would call justice. But this, now we're starting to see that the Torah is interested in what it means to build a society. And says Noah, by extension from what we've seen so far, to build a just society and a holy society. All of the values that we've seen in the Torah so far, Parshat Mishpatim is beginning to ask, how does this play out in a, in a full society? What would it mean to take the divinity, the holiness, the, the, the liberation, the justice, all of the, the themes that we've been working with so far and put them into action? And, and to do so, Noah suggests, as a kind of a contrast to other societies around that were not just. And what those societies are, we could turn to um, archeologists, but we can also just, just con contrast, at least obviously with Egypt, right? Not like that society where the law is whatever the king says, and sometimes the law is targeting minority population. You know, an unjust legal regime? No, what would it look like to create a just legal regime? Okay, that, that, that makes sense. That, that seems like a good theory of what the Torah is up to right now. All right, let's keep going. Wendy Becker. Um, I, I wanted to, I, this reminds me very much of art and music and all the arts. When you're talking about Mishpatim, I step back and look at it. I think that this is a foundation, kind of playing, uh, what uh, Noah had said, that God is giving us, this is the world that he's giving us to create, that we do these to have, to come from a place of mishpatim, of having ethics from whatever we do in creating this world. Mm -hmm. And then he goes, God, she goes into more specifics that we can also draw upon symbolically, just like everything throughout Torah. We're, we're studying specific stories about specific people and actions and deeds. And from that, we learn not just specifically from that, we're able to study and constantly glean new significance for, for these, th these things in Torah. So it's, um, Mishpatim is the <clears throat> basically like when you learn an art, when you learn to dance, you learn in ballet their positions, and you practice these very specific positions. And from that, you dance. Then from these very specific uh, foundations that you must follow, then you can create. The same thing in music. In music, you learn scales, you learn technique very specifically, and you study it and you practice it. And the more you do that, and you get that in your foundation. And from there, you can create and make it whatever you create your own. But ah. it comes from a place of a great foundation. Great. So this Mishpatim is, great. is our foundation. So, so Wendy's analogy is so, is so lovely and so helpful, right? Imagine that um, there's a dance. And this is, Mishpatim is the choreography. It's a justice dance. And Mishpatim is the, 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 the notes, right? The score, the choreography, the way that you play out these principles. There, there has to be a kind of a, an orchestration of it. And so we might think of Mishpat 
as justice, but mishpatim are the details of justice, the, the, the moves, the steps. How does this get um, implemented into the world where we're going to need a whole system? We're going to need um, a way of, of playing out for every specific circumstance um, these principles. And so, yes, we are starting to get in the weeds, but it's like it's, it's a choreography, right? It's a, that, that, that's, a, that's a lovely analogy. All right, let's take one more um, hit on this, and then I want to start to do some comparative um, work as we as we look deeper into this word. Ariella? Well, also what I'm seeing is because we've made a covenant with God that this is kind of how the how do we act? How do we act that we're a people with a particular relationship to God? that we're not just, you know, I'll do what I want and you do what you want and it's crazy town. Yeah, great. And, and I think that that's the way um, the, the, law, the law has classically been understood as our, our fulfillment of the covenant the agreement that we made with God. God will be our God, we will be God's people, and this is how we perform our, our part, right? This is what God enters into a relationship with us, and we, have, we now have obligations as our fulfillment of the covenant, right? So this is what God wants from us. This is, this is our end of the bargain, to, to live in this way. Now, Again, that I think is a, a, a good and, and, and classic answer. But again, why these things? And what are these things? What is mishpat? And so here I want to begin to, to think about that word. And the best place, I think the main place to go, as you know, I, I often go to the first place that it's used. And we're going to do that now. Anyone know where that is? Okay, um, we're going to do that now, but this isn't just the first place where it's used. It's used in a cup, in, in, in a context which provides us with some, some contrast and some, um, some um, framing that may help us begin to come up with a definition of mishpat. Okay, so let's take a look. The place where we're going is to Genesis 18 to see um, the famous story of Abraham arguing with God or pleading with God um, to, um, to uh, remit from the punishment of Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, so that's Genesis chapter 18. And that's where we see the word mishpat used for the first time. So let's take a look at, at how it's used. Now, the eternal said, God said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Since Abraham is to become a great and populous nation and all of the earth, all of the nations of the earth are to bless themselves by him. For I have singled him out, and here it comes. I have singled him out that he may instruct his children and his posterity to keep the way of the eternal, the Shamru Derech Adonai, by doing Sraka Umishpat. By doing sadaka, which is a word you may have heard before, and mishpat, which is our word for the day. Here they are, sadaka u mishpat. Leman, in order that the eternal may bring about for Avraham what God has promised him. Okay. So what do we know so far? We know that, some, but what do we know about mishpat so far? We know that mishpat has, is the way of, of God in some way, there's some relationship. Mishpat is the way of, of the eternal. We know that we're supposed to do it also. And we know that it's not tzedakah. Now that's important because that's another one of our classic words for justice. Justice, justice shall you pursue. You heard that one? Right? Justice is tzedek, tzedek, Tirdov, tzedek or tzedakah. Okay, so it's not tzedek. Now, 
what is tzedek? Okay, well, we'll soon answer that question. But um, but th that we, that already is helpful. But we've got more in this passage that um, that will help us out because um, this is God's naming of mishpat. But Abraham also names mishpat, and this gives us, I think, further context. So let's take a look at just the the next uh, part of this of this interchange. Okay, so remember, God wants to tell Abraham what God is about to do, and and what God wants is for Abraham to do tzedakah and mishpat, and also to become the great nation, to be able to inherit the promise, et cetera, et cetera. But some part of that will be to do tzedakah and mishpat. Now, God wants to tell Abraham, so God does tell Abraham. God says, the outrage of Sodom and Gomorrah is so great, and their sins so grave, I will go down to see whether they have acted altogether according to the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will take note. Okay, I'm going to go down and see, and if it's bad, then there's going to be trouble. The men went on from there to Sodom while Avram remained standing before the eternal. Abraham had been talking to three other people who turns out are angels, um, but they leave the scene and it's just Abraham and God. And then comes this famous, one of the moments Abraham is known for, um, which is the confrontation, the challenge to God. Um, uh, God reveals to Abraham this plan and Abraham pushes back. Abraham came forward, Avram came forward and said, Will you sweep away the righteous along with the wicked? Will you sweep away the righteous along with the ha'afti spet sadikim rasha? Will you do that? And take, take note of these words. The righteous is sadik, which is related to our word for tzedakah, uh, for, for one of our words for justice. So will you sweep away the righteous along with the wicked? So whatever righteousness is, it's in contrast to wickedness. Whatever tzedek is, it's in contrast to wickedness. So that's tzedek and tzedakah. Mishpat, again, is something else. So Abraham says, here, I've got, I've got to, uh, here's some case law for you. What if there should be 50 righteous in the city? Will you then wipe out the whole place and not forgive it for the sake of the righteous 50 who are in, in it? And now, now, now listen to this line, okay? This is, this is really the, the big line um, that, that we have to turn to to think about mishpat. Far be it from you to do such a thing. Chalila lecha. Far be it from you to do such a thing to bring death upon the righteous as well as the wicked so that righteous and wicked fare alike. Chalila lach. It would be a disgrace to you. And then this line. Hashovet kol haaretz. Lo yase mishpat? Shall the judge of all the earth not do mishpat? How could you do such a thing? Could, could the judge of all the earth not do mishpat? Okay, so now a little, like this already, the translation sort of in some ways suggests itself because the word for judge, shofet, is related to the word that we might translate it as justice, mishpat. And a shofet is generally speaking, the one who adjudicates. Moses acts as a shofet um, uh, before all the people. Um, um, Sarah, Sarah, Sarah earlier calls upon God to be shofet, to decide to judge between Abraham and Sarah in a family conflict. That word is, we, we, we are pretty sure about the translation of that word. Shofet is a judge. So then I guess we have some idea of what mishpat is, right? It's judgment, but that doesn't really fit here. Shall the judge of the earth not do judgment? So we usually translate it as justice. But of course, my question is, well, how would you translate? What is mishpat here? What, what Abraham is asking God to consider not wiping out the righteous, don't wipe out the, 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 white, the righteous along with the wicked. Khalilacha, that would be a disgrace to you. You're the judge of the earth. You have to do mishpat. The very thing that God said Abraham should be doing. So what is it? What is it that Abraham here is calling on God to do? What is mishpat? Okay, turn back to our, our crowd of interpreters. Mark? 
I think that what Abraham is doing here is being more than just polite and diplomatic, calling out what God is intending to do as something that's inappropriate. I think Abraham is calling God out and saying there is a principle in that's embedded in creation that even you, God, being the God that you are, with the omnipotence and the ability to do anything that you want, you too have to follow this principle. And that distinguishes God of Abraham from all of the gods of the ancient worlds and the cultures around who are characterized by being capricious, human-like, working on, on, on their desires and not following and not following something, a, a principle baked into the very organic nature of reality, which is justice. Okay, okay. I'm hearing a couple of, of definitions possible in, in, in that very helpful description that, that Mark gave us. Uh, Mark, I think, started by talking about God having to do the right thing. God has to be held to, the, to this standard. The standard is justice. And you have, to, you have to do what is right and not what is wrong. Now, that's a fair, in, that's a fair reading of the scene. But again, we have a little bit of a problem because we have a word there in the passage for the right thing. And that's, remember, the word for a righteous person is tzaddik. So the other word for justice, daka, is what is right, what is just in the sense of being the right thing, not the wicked thing. Okay, so, so maybe we want to find some other, some other translation of mishpat. But Mark also just generally is describing God as accountable to some standard, God having to be uh, accountable to some some standard outside of God. I mean, one of the 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 the, the potentially radical um, readings of this of this line is that there's something bigger than God. G Abraham is appealing to something outside of God, as Mark puts it, something baked into the fabric of the universe, and that is. The justice, the order of the universe, the laws of the universe, the, the standard of the universe, God is accountable to that. So is it right and wrong? Well, that's, you might translate it that way, except that we've got another word that seems to mean right and wrong, tzedakah, justice. Um, or is it just some standard of order that God must adhere to? But then how is that, what is that order? Well, how is that determined? Okay, so gr very helpful. Let's, let's, keep in, let's keep exploring. Rabbi Zaki? So I'm going in a slightly different place in Torah, and that's in Exodus, where Jethro speaks to Moses and saying, you need help. It's like in Talmud, where you need to have witnesses to make a judgment. I think also we need to have more than one witness. God might be one of the three or multiple with Abraham to make the decisions and okay. be the judge. Ooh, so I, I, lo I love this interpretation. This is, a, this is a, a really keen and clever interpretation. In some ways, Rabbi Zaki is saying something obvious and Noah alluded to it before, which is that um, it's, the word is related to judging. So this is God's judgment. God has, you should make a judgment, but it's not judgment like severe judgment, I judge you. It's like a judge, you have to weigh factors and take things into account. You have to make a, an appropriate and reasoned assessment. Whatever we want a judge to do, that's what we want God to do here. And then Rabbi Zaki says something interesting, which is, okay, now that we're thinking in the realm of, of adjudication, so we don't also, we also so, so don't want a judge to be someone who sees herself as acting unilaterally. I can do whatever I want. I'm the judge, right? We're thinking right now about appointing new, new justices, right? We want them to be people who are in conversation, who are making a kind of collect, taking into account different assessments of the situation, right? Taking into account witnesses, evidence, testimony. It isn't just what I feel like or even what I think is right. It is a weighing of the whole situation 
And maybe that does that's done in partnership with other judges or with other witnesses or with, with or with people. Right. So maybe that we want you to act like a judge, be a good judge. Don't just sort of decide what you're angry about. Weigh, think about this. And isn't Abraham wait, asking God to weigh things out? You got 50 people here. You know, you got like, you, think about the math, right? Weigh this all out. Consider the factors. Okay. So that's, that's a really, that's a really great interpretation as well. All right. Let me take one more. Um, let me take one more and then we'll, we'll move a little bit further. What we're doing here, we're just going to keep circling back and you can keep your hands up to the question of, wait, so what does Mishpat mean? But what we're doing is we're kind of, we're, we're trying to, to hit all of the, all of the, the high notes, the, the classic moments of, of, of usage in our tradition. And this is, this is, what, this is really the, the first and biggest statement of what Mishpat is. The thing that God ought to be doing, the thing that Abraham ought to be doing. All right, let, well, let's take one more interpretation. Matt, Silverstein? Sorry. Um, what is striking me here is that it's not about Kadosh, about holiness that I would, I can easily imagine these being very related concepts, that holiness is things being in their place, righteousness and justice is doing the right thing in the right place. They could be very, very connected, but we're not connecting them. It's as though they are two distinct, important themes, and let's not make them the same. So I'm I love not that. Say, I, I love that. That's, that is that's that's a that's a, a brilliant naming of of what, what I absolutely agree are two maybe the two central values that the Torah is 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 processing and trading in and the values are justice on the one hand and holiness on the other. I really think that what Matt said is such a, an important and and astute naming of you know when we're in the book of Exodus we're thinking about justice. When we're thinking, we're in the book of Leviticus, we're thinking about holiness. These two, these are two, the two huge values that that course around in our tradition, and perhaps our whole tradition it has it in mind to merge them. But in certain moments, we experience ourselves as distinctly in the realm of mishpat, which is not a holy realm. I mean, yes, it's infused by holiness because God is backing all of this, and I don't think we can ever fully extract one from the other, but it is fair to say this list is not a list of, of, of holy things. This is a list of practical things, practical, reasonable, social, just things. Okay. Uh, now we could, we could quibble with that, that dichotomy. Uh, we could say, oh, well, wait a minute. I actually see some laws in here that do look like they have to do with holiness. You know, um, we could say, no, these things are never never fully um, extractable from, from one another. And the whole idea is that they're being merged. But here we're naming the mishpatim and not the, not the holy acts. Okay, so Matt gives us that kind of contrast, which is very helpful. I wanna give you along those lines a similar, here's another classic way of thinking about mishpat. And it's another um, binary, another point of contrast. This, if we just went to the, 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 the headquarters for thinking about Mishpat in the Torah, we're now gonna to go to the headquarters for thinking about Mishpat in the Talmud. And the Talmud offers us a very famous um, dichotomy between two different kinds of laws. And one is Mishpatim and the other is Chukim, another word for laws. But the Talmud is very gonna very specifically say, these are two different kinds of laws and they, they somewhat map on to Matt's, to Matt's binary, but not exactly. So let's take a look. Um, the Talmud says that this is in Masechet Yoma in the Talmud. And Yoma is the tractate that deals with Yom Kippur. And actually in this discussion, the thing that they're talking about is the sacrificing of the goat on Yom Kippur and the pushing away of the scapegoat. One of the weirdest commandments in the Torah. And that's that'll be relevant. Okay, so the rabbis say that in Leviticus 18, there's, we see this word come up again, my laws, mishpatai, I shouldn't even translate it, but my mishpatim, you shall perform. 
Okay, so what are those laws? What kind of laws are those? And here the Talmud gives us a definition. Such commandments, which even if had not been written, justice would demand. And here the word for justice is din. Justice would demand that they should be written. And these are idolatry, sexual immorality, murder, theft, and blasphemy. Okay, so let's just, let's just make sure that we understand here. The idea is mishpatim are the kinds of laws that you would come up with all by yourself. Every culture would come up with these laws. Thou shalt not kill is not the great insight of Judaism. That's, that's like laws 101. Anybody would do that. Now, lumping idolatry and blasphemy into that list is a little funny because it sounds like we're talking about natural law, like the laws that reason dictates. And, and yet there are these religious laws in there. And I think the Talmud understands those to be reasonable, but that doesn't exactly fit Matt's dichotomy. But okay, this is a different dichotomy. R even if they had not been written, you would end up writing these laws anyway. Meanwhile, um, and my decrees you shall keep, such commandments that the Satan challenges. You may be surprised to see Satan, but Satan, after all, appears first in one of our books, the book of Job. And Satan is not the devil in our tradition. Satan is the angel who argues against us and tries to take us down in God's eyes. And how does Satan challenge these these laws and say what we're doing is dumb. In other words, Satan says um, laws like not eating pork, not wearing wool and linen, okay? The exemption procedure from the obligation to marry a widowed sister-in-law. That's a, that's a long way of saying yibum in Hebrew. Um, and the Yom Kippur scapegoat sacrifice, what we've been talking about. So the Talmud is saying this thing that we're talking about this, this law of pushing the scapegoat off the cliff, that's not, a, that's not obvious. <laughs> that's not reasonable. And it's actually quite a remarkable moment that the Talmud is saying, look, the fact that we don't eat pork, that doesn't make any sense. We admit it. It doesn't make sense. If, 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 uh, if Satan were here now, Satan would say, this is so dumb. Why are you doing these dumb things? So you might think because, and, and, and by the way, um, it's Satan here, but my, when Maimonides records this law, he changes it to the nations of the world. Not, not to call them Satan, but just he's uncomfortable with the idea of Satan. So he turns it into other people will make fun of you for this. This is not reasonable, okay? So you might also say these are empty things. Therefore, the verse ends, I am the eternal. In other words, I, the eternal, have decreed it, and you are not allowed to question it. Okay, so... So here's another vision of what mishpat is. Mishpat are the kinds of laws or principles of justice that are natural, reasonable, obvious, inevitable. And hukim are the other kinds of laws, the laws that are kind of weird and religious and God wants them for some reason we don't understand, but we have both in this tradition. Okay, so that's a definition of mishpat. And it'll become a very important one in, in Jewish tradition. But I don't know, does it make sense to you? Does it make sense to you? I mean, we, we haven't had a chance to go through the entire list, but we saw one of the laws. We saw what happens when a thief is digging a tunnel underneath. Is that inevitable? Is it reasonable? Is it like, oh, well, five, five oxen for every stole, one stolen ox, everybody would do that, All right? Like, how do we translate the Talmud's notion here that mishpat means basically like natural law, obvious law? Okay, so uh, you don't have to respond exactly to that question, but now there's more grist for the meal. Another definition of mishpat here. Um, let's, uh, let's turn back to, uh, to the crowd. Um, uh, Allison. Thank you. Um, so the word that I wanted to suggest was actually principles, um, which is a word that you just used. And I think it I find this kind of compelling actually, because what really struck me when I was reading this, this Parsha was how like a lot of the laws associated with Mishpatim, they are kind of like what you should do, even though your heart might sway you to do something different. 
like one thing that I was thinking of was the laws that kind of require that you return property to your enemy. You know, like you don't want to return the property to your enemy necessarily, you know, like, oh, he lost his cow, like car was a bitch, <laughs> sorry. But right, and then, but we're commanded to do it anyway. Um, and I don't know exactly where in the portion it is right now, but there was somewhere else in the portion where I almost found myself thinking of like communism, that like, you're not allowed to pervert justice just because you think the underdog should win, you know? Um, and right. And like, that's really interesting because I think sometimes there's this like Robin Hood kind of glorify, like we, we want to seek vengeance or we want to, in the case of, you know, Hashem and Sodom and Gomorrah, yeah. you know, that like God is angry at what the people are doing. And so wants to be like, all right, screw it. They're all dead. And, um, Abraham was saying, wait, like, what about the, what about the principles? Like, mm -hmm. would you really kill, like, wouldn't you save the city, like, on account of 50 or on account of one? Great, 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 great. Um, we'll return to that word principles. We'll keep that, that word in mind. But I, I'm also um, struck by, I, 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 Allison is, is answering a question for us that I think emerges inevitably from this passage in the Talmud, which is, if these laws are so obvious and so intuitive, why does the Torah bother to name them at all? We don't need the Torah to do that. Just give us our, our religious laws, because those we wouldn't have come up with, but these, um, and the answer is, no, we, we need them to be named as laws because they are, everybody agrees that we should have laws like these, but nobody's going to follow them unless they have to, unless it is a law, right? If I have the opportunity to keep, you know, keep the ox I stole, I'll just keep it. So, I, you know, out of context would agree, yeah, we shouldn't have theft, but we need a way to, to map this out and we need it named as law in order to, to hold us um, to account. And the other thing that Allison did that I think is important is in some ways returned us to the beginning of our conversation where we were talking about civil law, social, the social order. And that also might be a way of thinking about this, this binary is that there are, there are social laws. There are laws that govern how we interact with one another. And then there are just divine laws, how we interact with God. Now, again, it doesn't totally match up because idolatry is on there. But you know, if we had more time, maybe we'd tease out, how do the rabbis see that as part of the social order? Maybe they do, or maybe, maybe Allison's binary is not exactly the same as, as the Talmud's. But that is, very, that is another helpful way of thinking about mishpatim are about what we do with each other. Right? What do you, what what do we do? And so Allison, I think, nicely um, referred back to the Abraham passage. Abraham's asking God to think not just about some prin principle of justice in the abstract, but how does that principle apply in the social realm where there are righteous people and wicked people, and this will have consequences for everybody. How do you map out the social order? Okay, let's take a couple more uh, a couple more uh, thoughts before we we push further. Um, Jen. Yeah. Two thoughts, one really quick one, and that is I very much disagree that murder and theft are just natural laws that everyone would agree with. And it depends a little bit on how you define murder and you could define mm -hmm. murder out of this whole debate, but there are plenty of cultural contexts where that is not considered natural. Um, the other comment I would make though, is I don't think it's even on about that. Um, I think what it's talking about, and the only word I can come up for it is dialectic, but I don't think that's exactly right. Um, is our relationship to God has a parallel in our relationship to each other. And when we act in a just way in our relationship to each other, we are building our relationship with God. And when we act in the way with God that God is commanding or that we can negotiate with God, we are also strengthening our relationship with each other and especially one another within the people of Israel. And I think that's why they're both in there. It's not really about what's natural and what's dictated and all that. It's about how relationships build other relationships and divine relationships build human ones and human ones build divine ones. Okay, that's, that's exquisite. Uh, Jen's given us both new language and a way of synthesizing some, a lot of the ideas that we've, we've we've heard come up before. The new language is that what we see in the passage, especially um, with Abraham and God, 
is that mishpat is something that holds in the divine realm and on the human realm. And we are doing something that God also uh, should be doing. Mishpat is the, is, the, is the mechanism for regulating something in God and something in us. And maybe the way of thinking about it is that um, we have to treat each other in the way that we would want God to treat us. That's, a, that's one simple way of thinking about it. But there's some, some very um, mysterious kind of um, parallel between that, that which God does is accountable to manifests um, and that which, which we, um, we manifest in our interactions, not with God, but with one another, but acting in the way that God either would act or would have us act, right? Okay. All right, that's helpful. All right, uh, let's take one more comment, and then I want to show you one last spin on on the concept of mishpat. Uh, Leah Matsui. Yeah, um, we will do, and we will hear. That's what we said when we heard when we had this incredible religious experience, unparalleled, and we received the first commandments. And then I think that, okay, you guys said you do. Let me tell you what you need to do. This is, I would call Mishpatim the nitty gritty. And I agree that um, it works on what I'll call the heavenly realm with Hashem and it works with us. And that's why we are, it's, it, it's miniaturized. Uh, not a bunch of college kids sitting up till uh, college young people sitting up till the morning discussing broad philosophical concepts. I'm going to tell you how to make going to the bathroom holy. I'm going to tell you how to wash your hands and make it holy. I'm going to tell you what happens if you fall in a hole. Um, it's you. little teeny building blocks. Uh, and I think we actually ordered them when we said, you know, we put in our order when we said we will do. Okay, you guys said you're gonna do, here's the plan. Okay, okay, great. Okay, so first of all, and I saw some of this um, uh, as I was scrolling through the chat as well, people have suggested and, and, and Leah's giving us um, good language for thinking about these things as the, details filling out the detail with the 10 commandments is sort of like okay we this is the idea you're going to be commanded there are certain principles of justice that have to be applied you're now obligated in them so how are we going to do that this is the answer mishpatim is like working it out applying it the the all but but leah focuses especially on the 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 details the specifics the idea that that mishpatim parsha mishpatim seems to bring which is that all of our lives will be negotiated through these principles all of our lives. And that's how we end up with 613 laws, 53 of them in this part. So that's why, we, that's why we begin to become, the Torah begins to become, our people begins to become obsessed with laws because the idea is that it's not just the rules that you have to follow, it's the very way that you live out an entire life. There is a very detailed, intricate scheme and regime of practice that informs um, almost everything. Okay, now that's a good that's that's a good uh, description to have in mind as we turn to. I want to I want to offer you one last uh, vision of mishpat, and and I must say it's one that I I have I find particularly compelling. It's um, it's one that I read uh, many years ago from a rabbi. Uh, uh, named Eliezer Berkowitz. I don't know if you've heard of Berkowitz, but this is uh, his book, Not in Heaven. And I think it's the best um, book writ written in the modern period on, on justice in, in Jew and, 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 and law in Jewish tradition. Um, and he is a 20th century rabbi who worked in Chicago for most of his, his career and I think is under under celebrated. We talk about Soloveitchik sometimes. We talk about like Leibovitz, legal philosophers, but I think this is the great legal Jewish legal philosopher of the 20th century, Eliezer Berkowitz. And um, 
he has an a, in a different book of his this was kind of hard to find called man and god it, he has a series of essays where he just takes a word like we've been doing exactly what we've been doing and works through it and tries to find every usage that he can in the in the in tanakh in the hebrew bible and one of the words that he investigates is mishpat now i'm going to i'm going to show you a little bit about what he said but first i want to show you the the reference point that he eventually lands on he says oh this this line, it, this, we've looked at some other usages of Mishpat, but this is the one that he really wants us thinking about. And it's a verse from Jeremiah. It's quite a beautiful verse from Jeremiah. Take a look at this. So he says this, this is the clue to what, what Mishpat really is. Even the stork in the sky knows her seasons. Gam yada modeha. And the turtle dove, swift and crane, know the time of their coming. But my people pay no heed to the mishpat of the eternal. My people, even the stork knows her seasons and the turtle dove, swift and crane keep the time of their coming, but my people pay no heed to the mishpat of the eternal. So I ask you, we're, we're, we're counting down on time here. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna turn to, to, to the crowd, but I ask you to think like, what, what is going on here? What is, the stork knows when to come and go, where to fly, when it's, when, the turtle dove knows when it's summer, when it's winter, but my people don't know mishpat. They don't, they don't listen to mishpat. So there's some parallel being drawn here between mishpat and what? The way that the animals, the creatures, the birds fly, I right? think of a flock of seagulls or migrate or just follow their natural instincts. Okay, it's a little bit of that kind of natural law feeling here, but there's something else going on here. What is the, what would it mean for us to think of our mishpat in the same way we think of the stork flying from place to place? Okay, so here's Berkowitz's description of it. And I think it's just, I think it's just remarkable. So um, if nothing else, I wanted to share this with you today. If we understand mishpat to mean ordinance, law, or commandment, the comparison between Israel and the seasonal birds who follow their instincts is difficult to interpret. If, however, the mishpat of the eternal is a cosmic principle of measured, balanced relatedness. I just want to say that again. A cosmic principle of measured, balanced relatedness, which applies to the whole of life, to the realm of the spirit, no less than to the realm of nature then the meaning of these words of Jeremiah becomes clear. These seasonal birds know their appointed times. They sense the, the orderliness and interrelatedness in nature. Thus, they know when to come and when to go. But Israel does not acknowledge the same mishpat as it prevails in the spiritual life of the world. Okay, so what's Berkowitz's answer? What is mishpat? Mishpat is uh, the cosmic principle of order. Is that a definition of justice? Perhaps, but it's a very different kind of justice than the right thing. It's the way of things, the order of things, almost like nature has its laws and rhythms. These are the kinds of laws that we're thinking about. Laws which are like physical laws almost natural laws, but not natural laws like natural morality, natural, the structure of existence, okay? And we're, we're just about out of time here, but um, I would turn to you and ask you, okay, so but what does that mean for us? How do we play out Mishpatim? So instead I'll have um, Rabbi Berkowitz answer that question in his next paragraph. And here is, here's a description of, well, that's very abstract, cosmic principles of measured relatedness what does that mean for us? And Berkowitz answers, and I'll, I'll leave you with this. How shall we formulate this? Oh, 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 oh. Okay, sorry about that. How shall we formulate this cosmic principle of mishpat when it is projected onto the scene in which human beings find themselves in contact with each other? Is it not also a weighing and measuring of claims drives and desires, a balancing and harmonizing of the whole with a view to its preservation and its God intended functioning. Justice and law are like God's mishpat 
in the act of creation. And appropriateness determined not by abstract consideration, but by the reality of man's condition and subserving the meaningful preservation of human life. Okay, bit of a mouthful, but a, but a beautiful mouthful. And I think he there is incorporating a lot of the things that we've been talking about so far. The idea that, that justice, that the, the justice of Mishpat is one that, that takes place in the, the human realm, that it requires a a, a, the spirit of a judge to weigh and measure claims. That there is a kind of um, there's a kind of a, a a holiness, a godliness being brought into the very practical, real world realm of not abstract considerations. But what do we do? How do we work this out in real time? A lot of the things we've been talking about, but I think what what Berkowitz adds to it is this idea that Mishpat perhaps describes the kind of architecture of creation. And, and, we, and, and I heard words like this. I mean, Matt used words like embedded, embedded in existence itself, just like the stork knows when to fly east for the spring. I'm just making that up. So we ought to, we have rhythms that we are supposed to follow, but we're more complicated. And so our rhythms have to include also not just our instincts to eat, and but also um, it all also have to, we have to adhere ourselves to the cosmic principle of justice. The cosmic principle of justice, which speaks to the way we relate to one another and negotiate our lives and try to preserve our, our lives here in the social realm. And that is what Abraham was talking about. How do you, God, assess this social realm? And that perhaps is also what the Talmud is talking about when it thinks about the reasonable laws that would orchestrate the well-functioning of a society. I think Berkowitz picks up on a lot of the things that we've been talking about here, um, though he's got his own spin on it. And we've heard a lot of spins on Mishpat. I think we've done a good job of deepening our understanding of this word. There's obviously more work to do. So uh, I encourage you to move through this, this Parsha, all 53 laws, and try to make sense of how is it that all these 53 things are called specifically Mishpatim. All right, thanks everybody.